I've been working in Kenya for 10 years. There are, I have a lot of stories. Um, and uh, this is basically going to cover just a few of those stories and kind of what's been going on for 10 years. So some of you may have seen a sort of standard presentation, either myself or uh, my partner, Mikkel, gives where we like to use this photo. This is Kibera uh, slum in Nairobi. And it's the largest slum in Kenya and the maybe East Africa. Anyway, sometimes it's said to be the largest slum in Africa, but we've determined that's probably not the case. Um, but this project, if you can see the rooftops there, they have eyes on them. This was a project by, uh, his name is JR, this graffiti artist who's very kind of globally famous. And I just always like this photo because it's really what we're trying to do, kind of bring visibility to this, or it's what we were originally set up to do, really bring visibility to this slum. Um, so uh, this is Mikkel, who some of you probably know. Uh, we were in Kenya, this is just a couple of weeks ago, we had a big party for Map Kibera's 10th kind of birthday party. Um, so, uh, and there's me, and there's a lot of people you can't see because it's a very bad photo, but um, this is what we're doing now, having parties. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, Map Kibera, this was a couple days ago, um, training some young people and government officials in a county, sort of a rural area of Kenya, just a couple days ago to do mapping. So currently still active, basically. People are always often like, is that Map Kibera thing still going on? So uh, very much so. So some moments of triumph and struggle. So let's see. I'm going to try to focus on some fun stories. So this can be a little bit more entertaining for you. This is a satellite image of Kibera. You can see that the density is kind of insane. Um, and we, we estimate around 250,000 people in two and a half square kilometers living in this slum. Um, 250,000 was our estimate a few years back. That's sort of the latest time that there was something reliable to work with to give an estimate. So 2009. <laughs> um, uh, so the way that this project started, actually there, uh, Jubal, who's sitting right here, can you raise your hand, Jubal? <laughs> he did a proposal uh, to a small uh, organization or foundation called Jumpstart, which I don't even know if they're still around. Um, to do fund this mapping. They did they they funded small mapping projects with OSM before. And I was actually reading that proposal today. So we still have all the documents <laughs> dating back. Um, and he recruited Mikkel, uh, who at that time was my boyfriend, uh, to do this mapping in Kibera, this slum, because basically it just was not mapped. And it was kind of blank on OSM, blank on, well, they're like Google was pretty like nothing in Africa at the time. So um, he was like, okay. And I was like, okay, let's go. So there he is with his GPS devices in this extremely uh, safe case. <laughs> like it's a pretty intense case. Um, getting them ready. They, they really loved uh, Obama, of course. So we have this Obama conga. And we tried to recruit some young people that lived in Kibera. And these are four of them. So. <laughs> They look really excited, right? Um, so yeah, part of the issue was when we got there, it was like, we don't know who wants to map this community, but we're gonna choose people that live here and grew up here um, and, are, and know it like the back of their hand because it's a very complicated place to map. Um, but we had no idea how to pick them and all of them kind of acted like this for like pretty much the first year. Like they hardly said anything a lot of the time. And we were trying to be like exciting and ask for their opinions and thoughts about everything. And this was a lot of time what we got. Um, but anyway, it worked out. They did the mapping. They were using GPS devices. And on that clipboard, actually, that time we were trying to use walking papers. Um, that's the room that we were training in. And this is uh, traces from three weeks, uh, two or three weeks of walking around with those GPS devices. Pretty, pretty awesome map there, actually. The map, so blank, filled in. Not all the way filled in. Right now it's a lot more filled in, but this was kind of like the first pass. Quite, quite good though. I mean, these are kids that hadn't really used computers. Um, they were quite young, like, anyway, 
So we did what uh, I think you are supposed to do, which is make a cake with the map. If you haven't done this, um, you should. Because you, know, you can use OSM for anything, including um, printing on a cake. It's totally legal. Um, we were a little surprised how much attention we got right away from that. In fact, there was uh, the BBC Digital Planet interviewed Jubal before the project started. And I was just listening to that too, because they came back now 10 years later, they were doing a recap of like what's happened to these projects we had on the radio 10 years ago. And I was like, wow, they even like were excited about before it had happened. Just the idea. This is one of our early mappers on a geospatial revolution, a video by uh, University of Pennsylvania or Penn State University, which has gotten a lot of mileage in, especially like GIS classes and things like that. Uh, we went to Ars Electronica, TED, we were in the Smithsonian and Al Jazeera. Anyway, just, it was exciting, right? And I mean, I was particularly excited that people were paying attention to Kibera. I guess that was, that was what I'd wanted in a way. Um, we did, but we kind of were like, well, what next? You know, so we got a grant from UNICEF at that time to do some mapping um, in themes, so we took the data that they'd collected and we just did, you know, health, water, and sanitation, um, education and such. And then we had these little discussions people could write on the map. Um, a lot of it was like, oh, you put this here and it's actually here, you know, but some of it was like, well, to get to the closest health center, we have to walk here. So this is some pretty interesting information. Here's a water and sanitation early map. But how is it all supposed to work? We were still kind of like asking those same 13 young people to like, what's next? You know, what are we going to do with this map? We wanted to make an impact in Kibera. We don't want to have this just be like the NGO map uh, for UNICEF or whatever. So we had this very complicated diagram. Uh, yeah, we, we thought this was all going to happen. And somehow there's going to be this service delivery. So everybody at the time was talking a lot about service delivery. And if people could like, you know, just SMS your your problems to the government, then they can fix them. So we're kind of in that headspace, the fix my street headspace. But anyway, this is a little overcomplicated, perhaps. Um, I came from a media background, so I started doing some video training. We, I mean, we had gone home and there was a young guy that we'd met who was really into video and he loved these flip cameras and he'd gotten some donated. He was at another partner organization and so I was like, okay, we'll start doing more videos like Kibera, news in Kibera. So I got a bunch of the flip cameras and I come back and the guy's like gone. And I was like, what? Where's Farage? Like he was a real big kind of figure in the community. He's a young guy. But, and it turns out he shipped off to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia to be a truck driver. Um, and I never like saw him again. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so much for that plan. Um, the next guy I recruited to run the video program he was pretty awesome. Then one day he was um, attacked, but in a case of mistaken identity with a machete, uh, I ended up having to take him to the hospital. Um, anyway, it was terrible and he barely survived, but he's alive and well today. But I also didn't have anyone to lead the program. So I just started doing all the training myself. A lot of things that you don't anticipate happen is my point. We started working with Ushahidi. Um, so started feeling like we had a lot of like brands going on. <laughs> we also started Ground Truth Initiative that I still work under that in the U.S. as a sort of company to do international training. Um, so we spent some time thinking like, how is this all going to work together? This was our office. We also ran into some challenges with office space. We were in a part of the slum that's kind of... Uh, not that safe. This is our newer office, but it's still in the slum. Um, and at one point, the our director at the time didn't pay rent um, for a couple months, I think. And the landlord confiscated all of our equipment, our GP, even our GPSs, which I don't think he knew what they were. Those were always really safe because people might steal your mobile phone, but they're not going to steal your GPS because they're like, what the heck is this? It doesn't do anything. So, yeah. So then he wouldn't give any of it back. So we, I think Mikkel actually had to take like a wheelbarrow and he gave us like the papers, like our files and just like 
roll it down the street until we could find our next office. We went to Dar Salaam. We, uh, some of our team did training in Dar, which turned into like sort of the, the seeds of the larger, um, the hot mapping of Dar that came later. Um, so eventually we, um, we kind of brought it all together, I'd say, in the 2013 election in Kenya, which is the first election after the really violent um, election of 2008. We had all of these um, videos and people standing at polling stations doing SMS reports and pictures about what was going on at each polling station. Um, we also did these pretty awesome security maps, um, which, which had to do with where people had already said were hotspots. We, that was all through those focus groups we'd done earlier. Um, and that helped place different police posts and have like security watch. That m security map also got painted on the wall in Kibera. So we felt like there was kind of some local impact. That's what we, I think we were really after, um, was that not just the ownership, but also the impact. We did schools after that. Um, that is a school teacher looking for his school. We ended up with um, like a lot of work that we put into kind of attaching this these maps to government as well. So we were thinking like, um, how can this say, so we're doing the schools map. The schools map was done with the Gates Foundation. They had a grant that um, went through Development Gateway and partnered with us about uh, interoperability of data. So we knew that the Kenyan government had released open data and some of it was education data. So we ended up uh, pitching that we were going to bring it together with our data, our OSM collected schools data. So we did this intensive collection of schools and tons and tons of details about each school in Kibera, which turned out to be 350 schools, um, <laughs> and matched it to the open data from the government, which you can imagine was sorely lacking, although they did have some of the schools, but not nearly that many. And then we brought it to the sub-county director of education here, and she didn't have any of the schools. And then we went to like the national education officers. We kind of just sat around the office showing the map to people. Like that print map, um, we also have a website. They didn't want to see the website. So they're, <laughs> they're looking at the print map, and they're like, whoa, we don't have any of that data. Um, so we kind of worked up the chain. Uh, but then we got to like the top level of the education official in the or the national, not the top, but pretty close. And she was like, oh, this is great. You know, I think this other NGO uh, also just mapped all the schools. So we're like, OK, we actually kind of knew that. And they were trying to saying they were going to give us their data. Um, but she was like, but you need to talk to the economist. There's this guy, the economist. So she sent us down to the economist and the economist is like, oh, first of all, this other NGO concern already gave us a lot of this data, um, and also if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do this, we need to have all of it on our servers, and that's what he said. We're like in my office on my server. We don't like all this like foreigners with this data. So, yeah, that was sort of the end of the chain of discussion. And I mean, it was kind of unfortunate because we also never got a hold of like basically they not only took all of the uh, data from the other NGO but they just kept it. I mean, no, I don't, there was no way that they were releasing any of that data. So part of the reason of doing this is really like overcoming that. I mean, people collect a lot of data, but having it be accessible to people is a whole nother story. So we did have a, a pretty big success with this project. Finally, we had, this is the MP um, of the Kibera area, who unfortunately just passed away from cancer, which is really tragic because he's a huge champion of education in the slum. And so he was able to kind of lobby for more funding for education in the slum and actually build a secondary school. So, you know, it's kind of like a, a winding path to have a few stories like that. Um, but I think that you know, in a way, that's just how things work, especially we're talking about pretty intense, like, informality. <laughs> so even if you are going to work with, you know, we've tried working with more with government, but if you don't have sort of the citizens interested in it and able to collect it, you don't get, 
you don't get very far. Like he became kind of um, almost like a mentor to Josh. This is our 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 leader of Map Kibera. Um, looking a lot younger actually right there, but so you know, there's connections locally that happen kind of just naturally as well, which can lead to to impact, I found. Right now, or in the past year or so, we've been working with the World Bank on participatory budgeting mapping um, in rural places. This is a be actually a meeting um, where they're going to decide what's going to happen with the local budget from their county. Um, so there's this kind of not countrywide, but small movement to increase participation in budgeting, which is pretty awesome. Um, so these are some of the officials who we trained to do OSM mapping. Um, and the thing is they wanted to map these, these projects that, they, that have been funded through participatory budgeting process. So they didn't have like a way of tracking the projects. So we were like, okay, we'll train you. But they wanted it to be all of their their chosen people were like, well, why? we need to involve some citizens, some young people, you know? Well, that was okay, but let's just start with our own people. But once they realized that they actually had to like ford rivers <laughs> in order to map things, they they were like, okay, I think this is great for, for some young people that live in the... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize this mapping thing was so, was like mapping. <laughs> like you actually have to go somewhere and map it. Um, but, and you're also seeing like GIS labs kind of pop up. Um, this was funny. We just kind of one day appeared to this office of these of this county and there was a GIS lab there. And we were like, okay. <laughs> there was like some computers and a really big printer. And we really needed a map printed. It's actually hard to print maps um, or to get a print made. It's expensive. And they spent all day trying to figure out how to work that printer. So it's a little premature, I think. Sometimes it's just like... This is, oh, this is the participatory budgeting map for that area. Of course, it's teeny tiny. Um, so I guess in some of the tenure, in some, I think, you know, if I reflect back on it, we've basically, you know, I think I'm, I'm happy that we started essentially a movement where communities do map themselves and there's a lot of examples and people are always like, oh yeah, I, we've been working on this or that and we were really inspired by Map Kibera. So um, I'm really glad about that and that other similar projects or even direct offshoots have happened. Um, also researchers, GIS students, um, I think we have 400, I don't know, 400 Google citations is a lot actually, but <laughs> I'm not a scholar, but um, sounds good to me. Sounds like a lot. Impact in Kenya, I've mentioned a few things, but um, for example, facts about what's going on in not just Kibera slum, but we also worked in Mathari slum, Makuru slum, Kangemi, pretty much um, some smaller areas. So uh, really just getting that down and getting it into open validation and visibility, of course, for the, so this is something that people care about like that, that teacher looking at that print map and finding his school on it. That's like huge for him. I mean, some people work on things their whole lives in Kibera and they never feel really like uh, visible for it. And not only that, if his school isn't visible, how is he going to improve the school or get resources for the school? We're still really happy about this because it was a big battle for the MP and we were able to provide evidence that there were, you know, uh, 50,000 students and the majority going to informal or at, that is non-governmental schools. Um, spreading open street map and that's definitely picking up and thanks to not only us but a lot of other people. Um, and now the Kenyan government creating uh, OSM maps, changing the life for a few of our core team members. That's not a photoshopped uh, job. <laughs> so as I am going to run out of time, what's next? Uh, we hope to build capacity through training, mentorship, leadership, not only Kenya, in Kenya definitely, but even like regionally. Um, we're focusing in a lot more on like training, um, curriculums and things like that. 
working with companies. Now there's a lot of companies in Kenya, like actually Kenyan companies that can use um, geolocation in their services. Before it was like a little too advanced technically for a lot of startups and things. Um, but now we're finding that there's some really interesting startup ideas um, and also bringing efficiencies into supply chains. Anyway, so there's a lot of reasons that people are interested in accessing this, this informal settlements especially and having good maps for them. Influencing policy and decision making, which is what we've been trying to do all along with citizen data and amplifying citizen voices and also informing. Being a bridge to link also global partners with citizens, government, NGOs. So I just like to close with, uh, we, we need your help <laughs> and advice. And this is not uh, easy to keep going. And yet we've sort of found a way, but it's always like the landscape is shifting. We also can help you. So for companies or NGOs, we have the best, we think we have the best mappers in Kenya. Uh, we're we're getting a run for our money with so many new mappers coming up, but um, we have good training programs, good experience. For researchers, we have deep like local connections and understanding. Um, for the general OSM community, if you want to be like a virtual fellow or do remote support, we actually this like the connectivity is good enough that you can even do you know Skype uh, calls with people. It's definitely opportunities for anyone. Um, and I'd also like to say I've been researching sustainability with Open Cities Africa, kind of looking at some of these issues for the past year. Um, that's a whole nother talk <laughs> or topic, but um, anything that if you want to talk about that as well, because definitely these, these kind of groups and these local mappers really need to be supported to keep going and keep increasing and improving and keeping up to date all of the map. Thank you. I'm open for, I guess I didn't leave time for questions, but.